seven year old male child who presented with a neck swelling since past three months. Uh, it was associated with weight loss, and on, on asking, he said that he used to have palpitations. So, on examination that time, the heart rate was slightly raised at 110 per minute, and tremors were present. On examination, it was a grade 2 goiter, it was a diffuse swelling, no nodules, it was firm, uh, skin was normal, non tender, and no lymphadenopathy was present. So now you have a child who comes to you with tachycardia and tremors and assuming that we are having a discussion on thyroid, this is thyrotoxicosis. How do you differentiate the, the, the most common causes of thyrotoxicosis, namely uh, Graves disease, chronic lymphocytic thyroiditis, subacute thyroiditis, acute thyroiditis on examination and history just. So sir, acute thyroiditis is usually after a bacterial infection. So there will be history of serious illness, there will be tenderness, pain and fever. The onset will be very recent within seven days. Mm -hmm. On examination, their hair will be enlarged, but there will be tenderness. Severe, severe tenderness. Warm. If you have seen a case, it is more like an abscess. This is like a thyroid abscess in a way. And very important when you have an acute thyroiditis and thyroid abscess, there often is a connection. Basically, there is a sinus which is often there connected to the piriform sinus and the other area which seems to be causing a recurrent infection. So, there is something connecting to the ENT part and that causes this thyroid infection. So, I have seen a couple of cases who respond to antibiotics but then again they have a feature. So, recurrent this thing, unless you remove that sinus, there will be a problem. Yeah. Uh, then, subacute. Subacute uh, is caused by a viral infection usually few weeks prior to the onset. Mm -hmm. Sir, the goiter is not usually, I mean, for TFC, I have not found, you not see the goiter there, mm -hmm. but he will have signs of hyperthyroidism, there is like not a palpitation, and we might find a, um, that's it, sir, advice. Tenderness. 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 So, tenderness is very, very characteristic. They will tell you that there was a thyroid pain, they will, and if you feel, there will be a tenderness. So, subacute thyroiditis is tenderness. Then, if you look at CRP, it will be high, ESR will be high, those things will be there. If you do a FNAC, what will you find? So what is it known as? Subacute thyroiditis. Anything else? It's a granulometer thyroid. So I have been referred patients as tuberculosis of the thyroid because they found a granulometer uh, thing on FNAC, but that is actually part of the subacute thyroiditis. So that will be there. Uh, okay. Then uh, sub, uh, chronic lymphocytic thyroiditis. Chronic lymphocytic thyroiditis, as you know, history may or cannot, I think, might be there. Uh, so it will be painless. painless swelling. Goiter is there, it might be as we discussed, might be a postulated feeling. It mm -hmm. is a firm goiter, very important thing. So and, and the initial phase, when you talk about hashitoxicosis, it is the initial phase. So they will usually will not have much goiter and they will be uh, basically painless. painless. So we talked about severe pain, tenderness, painless. That is acute, subacute, and chronic. Graves disease? So Graves disease, enlarged. So, uh, soft uh, swelling, mm -hmm. right? the brewery will be present, brewery might be present mm -hmm. there. And, uh, Anything else you said about the thyroid swelling and eye signs? Yeah, so if you know. have eye signs, there are two types. One is the sympathetic yeah. and the other is the infiltrative. So if you have an infiltrative eye signs, it is clearly Graves disease in that setting. Now, what are the commonest cause of thyrotoxicosis with goiter. The commonest cause is Graves disease. Thyrotoxicosis without goiter? Graves disease. Again Graves disease. Thyrotoxicosis with eye sign Graves disease, without eye sign Graves disease. So why we talk about a lot in terms of our differential that if you have a eye sign and a goiter, you may not need a, a scan because that looks like a Graves disease. But the absence of it, still the most common thing is Graves disease. So you have to do a scan in that perspective before you make a decision in that regard. So now if you look at thyrotoxicosis, tachycardia, tremor, goiter, eye sign, yes, no, no, I think. Next no, I think. No, I think. So the most likely situation here is Graves disease. Graves So how will you proceed further? Yes. So first was a TFT done, which showed a suppressed TSH and T4 more than 30 and T3 more than 8. Based upon this thyroid function, what are you, what is the more likely? Thyroiditis, thyrotoxicosis. So, sir, so as we can see, uh, the T4, T3 is highly, is very high. I mean, T3 is almost three, uh, two times the uh, ULN. No, not the two, it's I beyond mean, the limit. Beyond the limit only. Can so, just be a TSH at the number? The TSH will be raised. 
It will not be raised, it will be detected. Yes, detected so okay. it is that you should write less than 0.01. So this is less than 0.01 basically. So it is beyond the limits of the machine. If you have how much thyroid hormone is there in the gland? For how long? Three months. Two to three weeks. So suppose if it's two to three months and you damage, how much will it increase? Maybe it will increase uh, one time, one and a half times, two times. It will not happen ten times. So if you have such high level of T4 and T3, just by looking at this, I'm not looking at the patient at all, I'll say this cannot be a thyroiditis. In thyroiditis, typically, what you will find with the FT4, if your limit is like 20, you will see 25, 30, not more than that. Any patient which is going beyond double the normal limit has to have various disease. There is no confusion at all. So now, if you have asked me the patient on examination, I would say because you said there is a loiter, it is grace. This is doubly confirmed. So what we're trying to say is that your diagnosis is already made till now. All you need to do is a confirmation. Now, whether you do a scan or not is not going to make a huge difference to me. It is clearly a grace difference. Now, if we talk about a situation that this person went in for a scan, let's assume, and he came back to a report of uh, no uptake. What do you think? Thyroiditis. Two things. A technician scan, if it is done uh, wrongly, it can also show no uptake. It wrongly means? If the, basically, it is supposed to be taking the retest at 20 minutes. If they do it one hour, it might show no uptake. They did it at the same time. So then it can be a thyroiditis. But it is unlikely. So you have to be confident in your position that, okay, this is thyroiditis, not thyroiditis. So what can be the other explanation? If your metabolism is so fast, if your thyroid hormone levels are so high, somebody who is merely going into a storm-like crisis, your uh, uptake will be also very rapid. So whatever you take, maybe 20 minutes will be too late. It has already gone and gone out. The cycle of the scan is such that maybe by 20 minutes it's gone. So in very severe forms of thyrotoxicosis, you may have a false negative thyroid scan. This is a big message. So again, if you are not confident of your diagnosis, you will say, okay, thyroiditis. But remember, you say, no, this should not be that. So what can happen? Maybe they did it at the right time, but because it was going, the cycling was so fast, like if you treat them, the... Um, long acting beta blockers become short acting. So when you say Ciplar LA, it doesn't act for 12 hours, it acts for 6 hours only because the metabolism is high. Same thing will happen here that your cycling is so fast that your scan will give you a false negative picture. So this is a very, very uh, interesting thing which I have seen in a couple of cases. You have to be aware about that if your thyrotoxicosis, you are sure it is raised disease, but still there is no uptake, it may be because that you are having an issue on there. What else can cause? Such high levels and no uptake. Oh, exogenous therapy. Yes, that is thyrotoxicosis state tissue. So, if somebody is taking a huge amount of thyroid, you will have a high T3, high T4, and a TSH which is low. What will happen to scan? Low. How do you differentiate anything else which will help you diagnose that condition? Which biochemical test will diagnose that condition? TBG uh, or thyroglobulin, Thyro not TBG, thyroglobulin. So what will happen with thyroglobulin? Not yet. I mean, it will, it will be normal in TBG. In, uh, what is thyroglobulin indicative of? Thyroglobulin is a binding protein. No, no, that is thyroid binding globin, thyroglobulin. Thyroglobulin, so thyroid is a functional It is telling you about how much thyroid hormone is being endogenously produced. It is like the C peptide for thyroid. It is like the copeptin for thyroid. So, if you have an endogenous production like Graves, thyroglobin will be very high. If you have an exogenous intake, it will be low. So, thyroglobin will be zero in thyrotoxicosis factitia. Suppose somebody was taking T3. There are some T3 preparations available. What biochemical picture will you see? Raised T3, low, suppressed TSH, and? and low T4. Low T4. So that is this. I'm talking about a rarer situation just to highlight this sort of phenomena. So if somebody is taking T3, you will find very high T3, 
low TSH because T3 suppressing, T4 will be low. So that is a very uh, funny sort of situation. If you have a high T3, low TSH, and a normal T4, what does it mean? So the T4 is being converted into the T3 by some enzyme to that thing more. Okay, anything else? You are right, but what is the most common explanation of that? So when will you have low normal T4? I am not talking about low. Normal T4, high T3, low TSH. This is known as? This is T3 toxicosis. And the most common cause is? Graves. Graves. Why, why do some people have T3 toxicosis? Yes. So if your monodiabinase 1 is hyperactive because of iodine deficiency, you are uh, you're waiting for a full toss to come to hit for a 6. So body is waiting for how do I create more thyroid. You give them a, a TSH from outside, suddenly it will convert into T3. So you have high T3, low T4 and a TSH level which is very low. This is classical picture of what we say is a T3 toxicosis. So we talked about high T3, high T4, high TSH. That is TSH adenoma or a resistance. High T3, low T4, low TSH. That is external T3. High T3, normal T4, low TSH. That is your T3 toxicosis. So this is typical of Graves disease. Yeah, carry forward. So as and when we were expected, it was increased size. It was extra bit diffuse, and scan showed increase of the of waves. Now this child was starting on methimazole, 20 mg, 0.7 mg per kg, and propranolol at 40 mg. So what happened here? Uh, actually, that is not slide. Yeah, you tell us. Okay. So basically, okay. So that slide is one. Basically, what happened here on day, on first month of life? What happened? He developed this urticarial rash on his body. It was present throughout the body. It was highly prurited. So what we did over there is stop the medication. Actually, what we want to prove the medication was not stopped and it was treated with calamine lotion and it subsided on its own. So what are the three things you will tell to a parent of a child whom you are starting on thionamides? First of all, which of these, uh, this is Graves disease. First of all, whether you like to go ahead with what are the primary modalities? So this age is? He is 11. So would you want to go ahead directly with iodine? Yes, I I mean, for iodine, no, no, it's first antithyroid drugs. So, antithyroid drugs. Because you can, some people talk about primary iodine yeah. approach as well, but because of this level, he's going to stop. He'll die if you send them to iodine. What is the other contraindication of iodine therapy? Pregnancy. Yeah, but not in this no. case. Anything else? Uh, history of us. So, you talked about age, some people say less than 5 years. Now, people talk about 5 years, five 10 years, years stuck 5 to 10, you can think of relative indicators. Beyond 10, people are talking about primary right. therapy. So what, one is that he is such bad situation, you have to control it before you treat. The other is that there should be no eye sign. Yes. Because eye signs tend to worsen when you give radioactive So in this case, what you have seen basically is that you start with antithyroid. Which one will you start, PTU or methimazole? Methimazole. Why not PTU? So PTU uh, has a higher history, higher chance of hepatotoxicity than uh, methimazole. And that is idiosyncratic. Idiosyncratic. Both of them have a dose dependent hepatotoxicity, but PTU is definitely a much higher chance of a more idiosyncratic hepatic. So, the only role of PTU is first trimester of pregnancy. This is when it is recommended. Otherwise, no. If you have a very rare situation, somebody is not having a lot of side effects with methimazole, you can't do radioactive iodine, you can't do surgery, maybe PTU, but you have to be very, very cautious. So, methimazole. Dose. So, uh, methamazone starting was 0.5 to 2 mg per kg. Up to 1. Okay. Usually, you, in this sort of severe case, maybe 1, 1 will be required. One. Remember, this is not going to do anything. Because this is just decreasing production. You've got 3 months of store already there. So, it is going to take, there's a latent period which is there in that situation. PTO theoretically causes inhibition of T4 to T3, which is not there with methamazone. So you have to give beta blocker. Beta blocker is going to control the symptoms. It is going to decrease conversion of T4 to T3 as well. What other agents can you think of if this child was more sicker to begin with? Other than beta blocker than methimazole. Glucocorticoids. Steroids and? Uh, 
uh, iodine, logos, iodine. Yeah. So iodine, logos, iodine, SSKI, SSKI. or even iodinated contrast, which you can use. That is more for a storm sort of a situation. Very important when you got such high level of thyroid, your adrenal metabolism may also be affected. So some people say you might start steroid, which will help in that as well. So if you're going to covert uh, adrenal insufficiency, that will also improve with steroid. But I don't think we need steroids. Now, what are the three things you will tell to the mother? Once you're treating, what should she look for when you start this medication? So first of all, one is the very rare but serious uh, uh, toxicity it can be erythrocytosis. So whenever the child has sore throat, fever, or any infection, that time it is important at least to get a WBC count and stop the medication. If the WBC count is normal, you can restart. What is treatment. normal? What is that normal? So more than uh, ANC, more than two uh, number. So you have to be very precise as to what ANC you have to add. If the ANC is less than 1000, what you have to do? What is the role right. of GCSF? So I think this is beyond this, uh, this discussion, but you should be very, very clear. And we can maybe next time we we'll discuss about that. As to how do you manage, um, like uh, if somebody develops that agarlocytosis, that's a rare situation, but it may be quite life threatening in that situation. So as you said very rightly, any throat pain or fever, stop the medicine. Uh, what else you have to look for? Particular rash, rashes. Joint, joint pain, joint disorder. These three are the major things to look at. Now, agranulocytosis, what is the most likely time when they will happen? Few months, few weeks, two months. First, first two months is the most crucial. And this is more of an idiosyncratic as well as a dose limit. So, the dose is higher in the beginning, then it comes down. So, if somebody comes after one year that's saying now the count has come down, it is not because of this. It happens in the first few months of treatment only in that regard. So that was about that. Hepatotoxicity, of course, it is usually dose dependent. Idiosyncratic is more with PTU, I think you already said. So now you said that there was a rash, and this is also common. Now the problem here is that the rash may be part of the autoimmune phenomena as well. That urticaria may be part of the autoimmune arthritis part as well. So it is difficult. So if you are able to manage with a, a sort of a um, a simple antihistaminic or a simple calapur lotion, yes. that should be enough. Don't stop it because then you won't have any option to treat. If you leave this, he'll become, he'll die. His levels are very, very high. So, what happened to the course then? So, that's right. Uh, at least in the uh, course of the thyroid hormone, it, it gradually came down. We no, no, clinical, the, the adverse reaction is good. So, that's what. So, after the first month, the clinical improvement was there. Uh, he just took calamine lotions, following which there was improvement. But what happened at two months of uh, treatment, he developed sore throat and fever. Okay, so but that time uh, I spoke to the parents, they said one test was then probably a CBC, which they said it was normal and following it was continued. And so, so then, yeah, so, so it's a mayor situation. How common is the agranocytosis? The, or how uncommon? It is very, it is very so then, no, less than one percent, one percent, less than one, somewhere around that. So, when you look at this January figure, this is four months into treatment. What, how do you read this figure sign? This is a situation of a high T, uh, normal T3, low FT4, and a normal TSH, a low TSH. So the TSH normalization will take time. So it is the opposite of your case. Yes. So like in your case, the TSH normalization was taking time. This is the opposite case. So don't go by TSH. If your thyroid is normal after two months, there seems to be a missing dose. Yes. Missing time, missing report in middle. Yes. So, in that situation, we should reduce the dose by half. As soon as a T4 is normal, don't wait for it to go low. You have to reduce it to half. So, now carry on. So, uh, so I'm just explaining the. Yeah, the FT4 was slightly low. Yeah, so the dose would have so to be reduced maybe around, uh, he might have been on 30, he would have made 10 or something. So he was on 20, he was on 10. After this FT4, it was changed to 5. 5. So now 5 is much less. So earlier also from 20 to 10 has been done. So maybe there's a report which is yeah, there is. There is not there. there is. Just a uh, short discussion. Basically, minus side effect of thionamine to write is rash, vertic area, arthralgia, fever, abnormal taste, nausea, vomiting. It's cut out. Actually, it was meant this slide is not showing properly. Serious manifestations include agranulocytosis, which occurs in 0.1 to 0.5%, occurs in the first two to three months as we discussed. 
Okay. WBC count or if there's fever, sore throat, any other infection, stop it till the reports come and recovery occurs in few days. Now, should we regularly monitor these patients for WBC count? ATA does not recommend regular monitoring for these patients. Uh, hepatotoxicity, look for jaundice, dark urine, so this cell research told. You should tell the parents about lights to the abdominal pain. Stop the drug immediately, do an LFT immediately. If it is more than three times, stop the drug, keep repeating weekly until it becomes normal. Do we do a baseline? Baseline should be done to see at least uh, how much. Yeah, so normally thyrotoxicosis itself will cause high SG. Both hypo and hyperthyroidism both cause high SG. So if it's less than 100, don't worry in that situation. Uh, okay, so PTU basically what it does, it causes fo focal hepatic necrosis and PTU may lead to fulminant necrosis. MMZ, MMZ usually causes cholesterol dysfunction. PTU hence is not recommended first line, only in pregnancy first trimester as well as then. Other things such as handcuff vascular, uh, vasculitis, so that's what, a rash can be either suggestive of that or it might be a first sign of a handcuff positive or vasculitis. So if it does not subside with your uh, the scalamine and the histamine, we should keep this in mind. Other thing, this is treated with glucocorticoids or cyclophosphamide. Uh, other rare uh, adverse effects are pancreatitis, keratogenicity as the is for pregnancy, and a very rare is an autoimmune uh, hypoglycemia may also be caused, but it is very rare. And aplastic anemia. <coughs> so keratogenicity is uh, commoner with which one? PTU or in Methimazole and carbamazole. That's why we say the first trimester you should use PTU. So normally the convention is that when some lady wants to become pregnant, you look at how much dose is she on and uh, uh, whether you can stop the therapy. So if it's on a low dose, 10 milligram or something, you try to stop it and then advise pregnancy. If it is high and you don't think it will be able to stop it, do a radioactive adding therapy and then six months later she can become pregnant. During this pregnancy, there is a risk of grave disease in the baby because that antibody is not persistent. The second thing is that if suppose somebody comes to you that they are on medication on methimazole and become pregnant, normally you should discourage that. But if it happens, don't no need of uh, asking for termination of pregnancy. The risk is very very rare. The risk is mainly of aplasia cutis and some of those skin manifestations. You switch over to PTU for the three months. The conversion is one milligram is twenty milligram. So one milligram PTU becomes twenty, and then after three months you come back to. So we have got a lot of those pregnancies which have come out to be normal and they are now increasing evidence that maybe it is not as bad as what it was considered. A short note about the orbitopathy. So basically what happens is as we know due to the antigenic similarity, uh, orbit, the retroorbital tissue can be invaded by the antibody. So what ATA mentions is like what we should also be doing in our OPD, like every visit you ask the patient whether you have a painful feeling behind the globe, whether you have pain with eye movements, there is redness of eyelids or conjunctiva, or swelling of the eyelids, or edema of the conjunctiva. So this is at every visit. And then if you find something, obviously refer to an ophthalmologist. And following visits, if you see that the proptosis has increased more than 2 mm, this is mostly done in a, I mean, ophthalmological setting, I would say. If it is eye movement more than 5 degrees, or degrees in visual equity, more than three of any of these is considered to be active orbitopathy and should be taken, action should be taken. Now, since this is a clinical uh, discussion, I thought I will just discuss the, the, clin the clinical signs. So, most of if a patient comes to you, first thing, if there is a rim of sclera between cornea and upper lid, think lip, lip retraction. So, the, as you can see in this patient. So, that is a kind of dalrymple sign. The name is not so important, but at least the sign you should know what to be looked at. Infrequent blinking and staring appearance, which both can be seen in this patient. If you see, uh, one graph is saying basically ask the patient to look down. If you see upper sclera, that means there is a lagging of the upper eyelid, meaning there is a lid lag. Other sign, Rosenberg sign, if you ask the patient to close the eyes, there will be tremors in the eyelids. That is called a Rosenberg sign. Joffrey sign, basically you ask them to look up. So the folds of the, fo uh, uh, the forehead will not be formed, as you can see. Photo is not coming. And last is the Mobius sign, there is loss of convergence. So, if we look at these basic signs, we can diagnose at least some bit of orbitopathy and work forward to it. So, I think uh, this was an interesting discussion with regards to paratoxicosis as well as uh, the congenital hypothyroidism.
and I think we continue this module sort of a form because this gives a different perspective from just the theoretical discussion. So we we'll keep on discussing the theoretical part, but we'll continue on that. So if there are any questions, we'll take. Uh, so uh, Dr. Rashmi Nagaraj is asking: Are there any clinical features of subclinical hypothyroidism in children? When do you suspect subclinical hypothyroidism? So basically, Dr. Rashmi, subclinical hypothyroidism is actually a bioclinical diagnosis. So when you actually saying that there are symptoms that we automatically exclude this as a subclinical hypothyroidism. Now what really is subclinical hypothyroidism? It basically means that you have got a high TSH and a low FT4. This is what it is, a normal FT4. If FT4 is low, it becomes a clinical hypothyroidism. So how do you define it becomes difficult, but usually this TSH will not be more than 10 in most cases. So the features will be very, very subtle, difficult to identify. Some people say dysthymia, mood disturbance, subtle of those neuropsychiatric manifestations may be there. But other definitions of clinical hypothyroidism is something which is basically a biochemical diagnosis. So you are of course do suspecting it. Whenever you are doing a thyroid function, if you have a TSH which is borderline, think about that. Uh, now uh, Dr. Rajiv Bansal is uh, asking these medicines will be available offline. In the particular module. So, whatever modules that you're going to cover, they're going to go back. So, this will be part of congenital hypothyroidism as well as thyrotoxicosis. We'll split into different cases and put it up there. All of our recordings are actually part of the uh, module. So, if you see any of those theoretical discussions we had on DI also last time, is already part of the DI module. So, if you want to reverse, revise them, they are there. So, our innovative resources are growing on as well. So, there are some questions as well. Dr. Ram Shastri is asking how early can we see a case of autoimmune thyroid disorder? So I would say I've seen maybe two to three years also. So it's an earlier presentation which may be there. Uh, Dr. Rashmi is again talking about the same and he is giving the answers. Dr. Vidhu is talking about if high T3, high T4 and low TSH, what is the condition? So it's very easy. So I'll go again. So if you have got high T3, high T4, low TSH, it's very easy. This is thyroid oxygen. High T3, high T4, normal TSH. This is a TSH secreting adenoma, or rarely you're talking about a situation of a predatory resistance to thyroid hormone. High T3, low T4, low TSH. It's an exogenous T3 therapy. High T3, normal T4, low TSH. It is basically a T3 toxicosis because of an iodine deficiency. So 